Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Rams Brothers, the pod. I'm your host, Dean, and I'm joined by the other host of this show, Nick. Nick's got his Donkey Kong coffee mug. It's, what, five o'clock in the morning on your end? You know how the hell you're up, Nick. How are you doing? Six o'clock. I'm good. Um, You do what you do for the love of the pod, for the love of of the game. And um, we had a great game yesterday, us Rams fans. Uh, Almost entirely armchair, minus the first quarter, but we'll get into that. How are you doing? I'm pretty good. Um, The game yesterday was definitely one of those armchair games where you felt like after the first quarter, you could put your feet up, you could relax, you could check in on other games. Um, But I think the the fun in that game, Nick, was, uh, you know, a situation where you could get together with a big group of friends. You could sit there, you could watch the game without having to stress, which is, I think, pretty much what you did during that game. And I think that, you know, going into MetLife Stadium, if you did take the, the trek over there to get over there, which is probably a trip that I should have taken, I was concerned over the fact that the game would be so much of a blowout and you weren't going to be able to see some of the top personnel that the Giants had to offer in Saquon and Galladay and even Kadarius Toney went out early in that game. So um, I'm sure it was an incredible atmosphere, right? Being there with with other Giants fans, with other Rams fans, I'm sure it was incredible. But the game in general, right, it just didn't seem like the Giants were prepared outside of the first, you know, quarter or so to, uh, to play that game. So again, you know, it's, it's, it's a situation where you're you're looking at a guy like Daniel Jones, a coach like Joe Judge, uh, just the overall resources, the investment the Giants have made over the last four or five years, and you don't know where this project is going to go, right? So um, you saw that the headlines, I'm sure, in New York were, were troubling. Um, they were very anti-Giants, and obviously it was a night where the Giants were able to honor the Super Giants, right, which is kind of how the, the New York Post kind of headlined it, the Super Bowl winning Giants teams. Um, to go out there and lose a game 38 to 11 uh, is not something that you want to do to be able to represent a, a time that, you know, you want to be able to celebrate forever. So um, I couldn't imagine, Nick, what it's like to be a Giants fan. I know you have friends that are Giants fans right now. So just kind of wanted to hear if they were checking in with you or if they had anything to say. Yeah, I was freaking out in the beginning uh, of the of the first quarter and I was texting my friends that are Giants fans. I was like, we suck. We're the worst. Um <laughs> You guys are going to win. Like, we can't do anything. This offense is slow to start every single time. And my friend that's Giants fan texted me back. He's like, stop. Realistically, this game's going to end 35-13. Uh, like, maybe even more. And the final score was, what, 38-13? to 38-11. Like, he, he, mm-hmm. was, he was right on the money. Um, yeah. he, I mean – they're just done. He before the game, he was saying stuff like, "Why are we even playing this game? I, I wish we could just forfeit. There's no reason to play. It's going to be a massacre." And they didn't take their foot off the gas pedal. The Rams. They were just. Uh, they were putting on a show. They had everybody pretty much out after the first uh, or in the fourth quarter. You have Wolford in there um, throws a pick. <laughs> I'm sure that made your day. Yeah. No, it was. Um... I think what Danny Jones did in the beginning of the game, the very first play of the game was a strip sack. Uh, He went on to lead the Giants to a 68-yard drive that was capped off by a nice little field goal to start the game. But that offense led by Danny Jones, they were only able to rack up 48 total yards over their next seven possessions in the first half. So it was a 68-yard drive to start the game, 48 total yards throughout the rest of the first half. And it's it's not really a surprise, right? We we understood the impact of Kadarius Tony before the game started. Once he was knocked out of the first series with an ankle injury, I kind of said to myself, they don't really have anything else to offer on offense, right? I would be surprised if they were able to get another touchdown in this game. Um, so it's just a situation where you're, you're watching Matthew Stafford and company get off to a wobbly start. He took a couple of sacks early on, and there were no points on the board until 10 and a half minutes left in the second quarter. Um, But the early sacks, Nick, just going back and watching it, felt like it was very much a byproduct of some of the decent coverage downfield by the New York Giants. And then it was a handful of long developing pass plays that McVay likes to get cute with early on in games. So the Leonard Williams sacks, uh, they ended up he ended up sacking Stafford twice uh, early on in this game on third down. But then after that, the the pocket was kept perfectly clean and the Rams were able to kind of maneuver around and call the game plan that they want to call. Um, but the only reason I believe that McVay is so frustrated, he made comments on this after the game, that he's so frustrated is because he doesn't want his quarterbacks to take sacks early on, get hit early on, right? One of the reasons I feel like McVay has just been so frustrated with his play call- calling early on, you could you could very easily be methodical early on in the game. 
right? Or you could take a sample size of some of those later possessions that you have in this game. There was one before the second half where I think they they went, you know, minute 40, marched down the field and scored a touchdown. Um, so you could take pieces from some of your other successful drives later in the game and try to compound them into a couple of successful early series, right? And I feel like that's a situation where McVay wants to get better. And Nick, I know you were frustrated early on in this game texting us, we suck, texting your friends, we suck. But I understand where the frustration comes from because what is the excuse to not be executing early on in this game is what I'm trying to figure out. Yeah, I mean, like they obviously turn it around and everybody can see that. Um, And they did quite easily and they become the team that you're like, okay, yeah, no, this is what you have to do to this Giants team. Um, You got to make them look like they're nothing. And final score kind of shows that we did end up doing that. Um, but then it like to draw a comparison to this Cardinals team, that g- game against the Browns in Cleveland is supposed to be like one that they circled like, okay, this is a hard game. And if you watch any of that game early on, they are like from the jump, they are good to go, looking great, phenomenal. And to see it happen to us time and time again, where it's a slow start, it's just, I don't want to get behind in those big games against the Cardinals and have to play from behind because it's a whole different then you're panicking throwing and you're not like you know letting those pass plays develop you're just kind of freaking out throwing it deep hoping in that you can get that explosion touchdown which McVay will always panic that's his panic button you know especially with Stafford now it's like okay Deshaun and yeah well two two great points made there Right, the situation with Kyler and the Browns, that game wasn't even a game if Baker mm-hmm. doesn't throw a Hail Mary before the second half to make it, what, 23 to 14? So that, that game was uh, completely dominated by Arizona, right outside of the mistake that they made before the second half, uh, which I felt like that was due back to them after the Hopkins catch last year, right? the, the Hopkins Hail Mary, which was just ridiculous. But at the same time, I think they called it Hail Mary. Um, but then on the other end, right, you, you're looking at this team, the way that they start slow. You talked about McVay just wanting the big explosive play early on in the game. The first two series, we'll just go through them real quick. Seven plays, 37 yards. The drive stalls. This is the first series because Stafford takes the sack on third and 10 and the Rams punt. The second series, it was a three play negative one yard drive and the Rams punt. That second series was bizarre though, Nick, to your point. I don't know if McVay felt like he had to put seven points on the board just through an explosive play or just because he felt obligated to throw the ball because he liked the matchup, but he kept... Matthew Stafford in the shotgun for the first three plays of the series. And he lets them sling it. And the result is an incomplete pass to Woods, a short pass to Cooper Cup for six yards. And then Stafford in shotgun again on third and four takes a seven yard sack. So the comments early on, the, the early struggles, uh, Mc, McVay also mentioned he was bothered by penalties and the slow start on offense. He said it's an issue with his own calls and getting a grasp of game flow. Shouldn't have an issue getting a grasp of game flow early on in MetLife against the Giants. I just he also he mentioned should... that he doesn't want to keep repeating it week after week. Just a suggestion. I know I mentioned this a little bit earlier in the pod, but you could again the the series before the half ended, right where you went up twenty eight to three. Um, there's another series early on in this game where they were able to run the ball with with Sony Michelle and Daryl Henderson and establish uh, time of possession, establish the ground game. Um, there are little pieces of those drives that you can implement, whether it's misdirection early on, whether you want to kind of keep in some of those long developing pass plays early on to get your receivers in tune. Um, it just seems like you're kind of overthinking the early scripted series. We've been talking about this for six weeks now. Um, and it's not, it's not just the only season we've talked about this under McVay. Um, but Nick, I want to get, I want to get your opinion. Cause I looked through the first quarter, just the overall point differential, uh, how we were making out against you know, Chicago, Indy, Tampa, Arizona, Seattle, and the Giants. They're plus 17 in first quarter points. And, I mean, when you look back, they've only scored first quarter points in three of their first six games. So, I don't know. In actuality, in actuality is it that big of an issue? And is it a blessing that this stuff is kind of happening early on? Or do you feel like this is more so just the identity of Sean McVay and him overthinking the start of his games? I think that's exactly exactly what it is um, because, you know, those are the scripted drives. Those are the ones that they've been thinking about longer than, okay, we're in the game. We're in the moment now. Now I can kind of understand what's being thrown at me and, you know, kudos for him for, for adapting. It seems like he, besides the bears, he hasn't really been able to uh, script a good drive this year uh, from the get-go from the jump. 
So I don't I don't know what that's all about. Well, and well, why don't we? are just... able to clean it up, which is what uh, which is really what matters. So yeah, I think I think that's, that's like, all that matters. But I, I, like, if you watch that Seattle game, and for us, like to put no points on the board for like that long, and then in this game too, it kind of feels like it took us forever. Um, I don't know if you watched any of the, any of the post game, but it's not like all like yeah, you know. We had had a great game. They feel frustrated with yeah. with with the start of uh, with the performance. That Seattle game still feels like we should have lost, um, which is funny because like that only happens against Seattle's where you play these like cheeky games and you barely win, but it feels like you didn't even put the better product on the field. Um, but yeah, I mean, I just think uh, it does worry me when you play a team like Arizona. Um, Green Bay is sort of having the same problem where they're not getting that motion early on. So I'm not like too it, – it's almost like LaFleur and McVay have a very similar kind of – Yeah. Well, thing they, they going do. On with both of them. They do. It's like um, soft to start. And like the run game can only be established um, once we're up, it seems. Yeah. It's like they can't either, they can't establish the run when they're losing. So he, he, he panics and throws it way more. No, you're right. No, I, th I think the the similarities with LaFleur and Rodgers and McVay and Stafford, they, one thing is they both have the ability to completely open up a game at any time, right? There were so many moments in that game where Devontae Adams or um, they're just – players are just running free, right? St. Thomas had a touchdown. and um, Who's the other guy? Lazard had a touchdown, right? These guys, these are guys that, you know, they're, they're fourth, fifth receivers on other teams and Aaron Rodgers makes them look good later in the game right after they're starting slow. So I don't know. I, for me, I, I feel like it's a little bit of a problem, but to be able to scheme a game in the second, third, and fourth quarter is obviously so much more important than it is to scheme in the first, right? But you see, when you, you are striving for perfection and you refuse to be complacent the way that Sean McVay is and the way I believe this entire team is made up, you get frustrated with early penalties and mishaps early on in games, especially against teams that are inferior. So um, I, I actually like the frustration. I like that he came out and that was how he started off his press conference, right? So I think that's something that um, if you have a head coach that comes out and says, look, we played a really good team game. Taylor Rapp gets a team ball. Daryl Henderson gets a team ball and we're all going to run off into the sunset. You're never going to win games late in the season. So striving I mean, uh, for striving for Henderson game ball was a little uh, sus to, did, in my opinion. Did Henderson get a game ball? I was, I was just spitballing. Oh no! Okay, he didn't. I'm, no, I'm sure. Yeah. I'm sure Taylor Rapp did. But yeah, at the Taylor same time, did. my only point is it's not all rah rah rainbows and sunshine all the time with Sean McVay. Although the post game press conferences, he 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 likes to evaluate himself in those post game press conferences, and then the morale thing when he comes into the locker room and does his whole, you know, the team speech and gives out his game balls. I think that's all good too. So you're kind of getting both sides to a head coach who you could tell has so many different personalities, so many different dimensions to him. But again, it's a little piece to becoming, you know, what he thinks of as a perfect head coach, if he could just solve those early game issues. Um, and then once those are solved, he'll have issues later in games and with certain play calls. So it's, it's just football is such a difficult game to call. Um, and I think Sean McVay is one of those guys that will always continuously outthink himself. He'll always want to continuously get smarter to the point where he's going to end up driving himself crazy. Um, but again, that's, you know, I don't know. It's, is that how you clarify genius, Nick? Somebody that just continues to, to work towards something and wants to be perfect. No, <laughs> no, it's not how you, I would clarify you, genius. That's you how I would clarify a, a hard worker. Yes. Okay. There you go. Who, who manifests and creates their own de destiny. Yeah, there you go. Um, a couple of interesting stats in this game. It was the first time the Rams have scored 28 points in a quarter uh, since they did it against San Francisco in 2002. They actually were down 20 to three in the fourth quarter of that game and came back to win 31 to 20. It's also the first time in Matthew Stafford's career that he threw three touchdowns in a single quarter. Um, going back to 2002 for a second, that game was so strange. The entire season was so strange. Going back to the 2002. They they started off well, just, just saying that we, there was a score gami in this game. You know, there were a lot of things that, that don't typically happen uh, in week six of, of NFL Sunday. Um, so they started off 0-6 under Kurt Warner. Um, we know he had a lingering pinky injury, the battle with Mike Martz. Bolger came in and went 6-1. and one. And then I believe Bolger went down. 
Um, and then Jamie Martin came in for the final two of three games of the season. In that game, Jamie Martin in the fourth quarter hits Reverend Ike. Dre Bott Bly rips the ball out of Garrison Hurst's hands. The Rams finish the season seven and nine, a year removed from the Super Bowl or a trip to the Super Bowl, I should say. Um, but again, you know, these are all things that teams that, um, you know, I feel like are on a path to being a top contender, teams that are going to make a playoff push. You, you beat teams like the New York Giants 38 to 11 at home. Um, so I was I was happy with what I saw. Cooper Cup's also putting up outrageous numbers. Um, the stat that I saw yesterday, courtesy of J.B. Long, absolutely blew my mind. In 35 years, him and Randy Moss are the only two players with 600-plus receiving yards and seven-plus touchdowns through week six. Cooper Cup and Randy Moss in the same conversation is something that I never thought I would hear in my entire life. Um, but we're here. We're here, Nick. I don't know. Give us your thoughts. Uh, they're they're great. I mean, uh, and I just love uh, I love Cooper Cup. I love Robert Woods. I love seeing both of them, uh, you know, get out there and make really big time plays. Um, hate the Cup is still returning punts, and I know it's like we want to get this security thing. Yeah, you want to get this ball and like uh, in his hands as much as possible. But uh, they, you know, when the game was kind of close, the Cup was out there because they, you know, think they don't. They yeah, there's less of a chance he's going to mess it up, and then. When you're up a lot, then you can throw out two two, uh, but I kind of would like to see him the whole time. Yeah, and, and not have cup return punts. Yeah, I would rather see. Two, well, because I, I mean that, that's the kind of game where you could make a mistake, right? If you're two two, although you, you never want to keep the Giants in a game. But if he did get yeah. hit, he got hit and, and and he went out of bounds, but the ball flew out. And he got hit. <laughs> that always seems to happen with him. Um, but again, you, you keep him in. A, you let him return some of those punts when you're within the ten yard line, and all you have to do is make a fair catch. I mean, you really need Cooper Cup to come in and be that security blanket. Tutu Atwell can't come in and, and secure a catch. I mean, it's, I feel like that's pretty simple. Um, uh, well, why don't we talk about the, the no look pass to Cooper Cup for a second for a touchdown? Um, uh, the, the tweet. I can't even tell that that he does it until later on. <laughs> it's not even. You can't even see it with the naked eye unless you go back and watch his head or his eyes. Um, so it's pretty, it's really interesting to, uh, to see how that's just kind of taken, taken a hold of the league and everybody's just obsessed with the no look pass, despite the fact that it's been happening for about 10 years. Um, but the one thing I wanted to touch on was Kurt Warner's tweet, and I'm just going to read it out loud for a second and you give me your opinion. I'm really not trying to be the old guy that doesn't enjoy fun things, but someone please help me with the no look pass premise. How does it help a quarterback? I'm all for holding eyes until the last second, but quarterbacks always bring your eyes with the throw. Way more throws missed for no reason, in my opinion. So tell me See, what you now think. That's, that's almost exactly what I tweeted, where I was like, it's fun until it's not fun. Yeah, because that's who you are right now. You're the get off my lawn guy. No, I'm not. I'm so not that guy. You and Kurt, it's a very similar tweet. Yeah, but why do you feel? why do you feel that way? Cause I don't want it to result in like a pick. I like, I'd rather like, I get that it's like cool and it's like a dope highlight, but yeah, you know, keep your eyes on the ball. There's no way you're throwing it better by not looking. Right. Right. No, I, it's, uh, it's extremely interesting, right? Cause you don't get any style points and it's, it's really just, there are cool, no game breakers. It's really you know? just a cool highlight. I'll give you yeah. NFL street. One of the best football games I've ever played in my lifetime. Me and my why roommate. Wouldn't, were, why wouldn't you recreate a version of that for Madden? I know, I know. We, 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 I was playing Madden 06 with my roommate yesterday. It was pretty fun. On oh GameCube. yeah, that's, that's that's a good one. It's one of the last, last good ones ever. Rams. Yeah, yeah, it's one of the last good ones ever. But again, the no look pass. Um, it's good for a highlight. I think the thing that was so it, like if you honestly go back and, and look at the scheme, how they schemed up that play. Mm. Cooper Cup was in so much space. If uh, Matthew Stafford turns his head and the and the edge rusher is able to get their hand up and bat that ball down. Matthew Stafford's head was turned in such a direction where once he threw the ball, the, the edge rusher wasn't even able to get his hands up. I'm so like, I don't know if you turn your head and you telegraph that throw to Cooper Cup if the ball gets batted down. But because, you know, people weren't following his eyes, defenders weren't following his head, that ball comes out to Cooper Cup. He's able to make a catch and just kind of walk. This is the up. game you do it in, right? You do it in a game where where you're already monstrously up and you're just going for the throat stomp because because you should. You know what I mean? So 
I'm getting a throw rip in. I think it's going to be mm -hmm. you, small fry. <laughs> and I think that's what Stafford was saying. And he looked at the, he was looking the other way. It was just like, why not? And I think, yeah, I'm fine with it if it's in a Giants game where you're already winning by like 28 points. So was it uh was it the week prior or was it two weeks ago and Stafford threw that no look pass like 30 yards down the field to Robert Woods? I think it was two weeks ago. Yeah, see that that's another one where, I mean, I was if it was against Tampa. I mean, it's outrageous, or maybe it was against Arizona. Um, but the throw across the middle to Robert Woods, where you're not even looking at the receiver who's 30 yards down the field in the middle of the field in traffic, that to me is is suicidal. So if you want to nitpick and go look and criticize a no-look pass, even though the throw couldn't have been more perfect, that would be the one that you criticize. Because if you're not looking, you make the mistake, you throw a pick there, um, you're, not, you're not putting your team in the right situation. So I understand it from Warner's perspective on that end. Um, it is just kind of fancy style points, nothing that he ever learned throughout his tenure uh, as a professional quarterback. It's not something that he teaches to his kids. Um, well, I, I think go, going off some of the most popular comments off of the tweet that we, we sent out yesterday, um, hmm. you know, he's been doing this. Aaron Rodgers has been doing this. Mahomes has been doing this was very popular. Um, if Mahomes did this, Sports Center would never stop showing it. And also, Nick, probably your favorite comment. Goff could never. Yeah. Um, I actually haven't been seeing it anywhere outside of our Twitter. You, you would think that it would be, you know, more renowned through Sports Center. Um, so it is a little interesting. Mahomes almost felt like he barely escaped the football team. So I don't know what's going on <laughs> with him. Uh, Goff could never accurate. Uh, he could not. Uh, Campbell is seems to already be uh, tired of of our boy Jarrett and uh, the trouble trouble in non paradise and then I like I know this is going to be this everyone's going to be like you're a fake fan whatever I don't want the Rams to annihilate the Lions like they did with the Giants this <laughs> past week and I think they are and I think it's just going to be a uh, I think it's going to be a throat rip. And, you know, the Rams are just going to be so victorious over this sad Lions team. <laughs> Throat rip. Um, how about like a 17 and a half point spread? Yeah, it's got to be, it's gotta be that high. Instead should we do, of 10 and a half. Should we do guess the lines? <laughs> yeah, we can guess the line. I'm, I don't, All right, I'll look it up right now. I'll look it up right now. Hold I've on. I've never seen one as high as 17. I would say 13 and a half would be as high as they would put it. I would go, I'm going to be that guy. And I'm going to say it's 17 and a half. No way. Let's look. I don't think it's over 13 and a half. Mm -mm -mm. Let's see. All right, so, so we split this one. It's 15 and a half. Oh, my God. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's going to be so ugly. Can't like the money line isn't even available right now. I'll tell you what's like going to be really interesting. As we're watching this game, um, and we'll we'll talk about this in the preview episode because I want to talk about the defense in this game for a second. Um, as we're watching this game, I'm going to be really interested to just see the interaction, right? When Goff comes out of the tunnel at halftime after the game, who comes up to who, who shakes whose hand? Yeah, um, you know, all the like the, the interior drama will be fun to see. Um, this is by no means a Goff monologue, uh, I should say, a but at the same time, it's a, at the same time. Probably as we're coming up to this week, we'll do some kind of gothologue. But, it, it, you know, if, if you're coming into the stadium, um, one of the things we wanted to do is give them a standing ovation. Some fans may feel like it's not just. Some fans may boo them. You know, I think that that whole engagement throughout I don't the know entire fan base, and it's going to be so interesting to see how, how the majority of fans react to Jared Is there going to be a video? Are that. they going to have a Jared Goff video? Uh, you have to, right? You have to. I don't think they're going to. That would be going. that would be very indicative of LA culture, and I would hate that. Uh, quite what honestly. to not have a Jared Goff tribute video? Yeah, uh, my money would lean towards them not putting together a tribute video for JG. I think it'll be I JG and Brockers. I think they'll both have. A, uh, a yeah, there. you know what? Actually, that may may go in in Goff's favor if it was just Goff alone in Detroit. I don't know if you do a reunion video, but Goff and Brockers, you could do a collective video welcome them, welcoming them both home. That that should happen. Yeah, maybe. 
Uh, also, just uh, that 17 point favorite is you could get that for Houston against Arizona. For Houston, oh, you, you're saying Arizona is a 17 point favorite in that game? Mm-hmm. That that to me is too seems high. low, too high. Seems too high. Se- seems like it should be plus 21 trap game for the Cards. They got to lose sometime. They're not they're not going to be undefeated. Yeah, here's the thing though, 10, 11, they eight. don't. It, like this team is starting to feel like that Panthers team. What, the, the Cam three, Newton Superman Panthers. I was going to say the three and three Panthers team. No, it. <laughs> Obviously not. I want to look at the Cardinals schedule real quick. Let's see who they have coming up. Texans, Packers, Niners, Panthers, Seahawks, Bears, Rams, Lions, Colts, Cowboys. Cool. Let's see some losses sprinkled in there. Let's, let's not get too crazy about the Cardinals, who very much look like the best team in football right now. Um, I'm going to talk about the defense for a second. I know we've been talking a lot about Robert Rochelle and David Long Jr. Um, I'll ask you this real quick before we jump into some of the matchups in this game. Was the defense too laxed early on in this game against Daniel Jones? Outside of the strip sack, were they too laxed on the first drive of this game? Um, third and 18 just kind of rings in my head. You can get them off the field to start that game and really just annihilate them from the jump, and they don't. They let them drive all the way down. Um, part of this defense, though, it's like they want, they're want. they looking for the Yahtzee. It's like throw on us so we can make a play. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like we, we, we dare you to throw, and then we'll hold you to three. That's kind of their MO. So yeah. – I just think sometimes it's like third and 18, third and 14. They had that twice in that drive um, and, and and they convert it on both. Well, and yeah. And that's, it's happened against Kyler. It's happened against Russ. If it happens against Daniel Jones, you have a problem, but yeah, it, it, Giants are an interesting team, right? This they, is the first game this season where Daniel Jones looked like the Daniel Jones of your. Yeah. Well, he also had no personnel on the offensive side of the ball either. I think his left tackle ended up being banged up in this game too and left the game. I don't know. They tried to throw a fade to uh, to Colin Johnson on the first half, or I'm sorry, in the first possession of this game, and Robert Rochelle was called for PI on an uncatchable ball. The flag was picked up, and that felt like it was the Giants' best chance to score throughout the entire first half. Um, and it wasn't necessarily the offense, Nick, the Rams' offense in this game who necessarily dug their way out of this game and won it, in my opinion. I felt like it was the defense who caused opportune turnovers – when the Giants were on, you know, their twenty, their own twenty yard line or their ten yard line, it was the second strip sack by Oboe that allowed the offense to keep pouring points on the board. They ended up going for, going up fourteen to three by scoring two touchdowns in less than two minutes, and then they, there was a three and out that was mixed in there by the offense. Um, but then they score on a four play fourteen yard drive after Taylor Rapp's first interception, um, and, and the offense was able to take over because the defense was putting them in in opportune opportune situations. You saw Matthew Stafford. You didn't see any 85, 90 yard touchdown passes. You know, a lot of them were, were very simplified. You saw the Cooper, Cooper cup out route. Um, you saw the Daryl Henderson down the sidelines you know, nothing was, you know, 40, 50 yards down the field. And it was because the defense put him in that situation. Leonard Floyd, Aaron Donald, Oboe, Karankro combined for nine pressures, three total sacks and two forced fumbles. One of which I mentioned was on the first play of the game. Leonard Floyd generated a pressure on 15% of his 26 pass rush reps. Uh, that's a pretty good percentage from your edge rusher. And please apologize to Taylor Rapp. I uh, picked off Danny Jones twice. He registered a hit on Jones. And Almost also- three times, too. Like, there was one that I thought he caught where he, like, caught it by his legs and was, like, trying to bring it up. Yeah. I mean, he had three pass breakups in this game, too. So, again, we talked about how that stat line has game ball written all over it. We believe he got one. But keep in mind – you know, this whole Taylor Rapp, David Long Jr., Robert Rochelle controversy, you know, this is an assignment in this game against, you know, against man. If you're playing in man, you don't have any difficult matchups, right? These are all guys, practice squad players. You're missing Galladay. You're missing Tony. Um, there's nobody that's going to really be able to kind of, you know, dismantle you as a defender. So when you're in man, you're in a zone. These are far easier assignments they've, than they've been in past weeks. You know, you talk about guys like Lockett, Antonio Brown, uh, A.J. Green, right? All the uh, uh, DeAndre Hopkins, all these weapons that you've seen over the past three weeks. And now all of a sudden Taylor Rapps, Taylor Rapp gets this C, D level assignment and is able to show out. Um, so it's a really nice performance by Taylor Rapp. You know, if you went and watched the um, the Steelers-Seahawks game, 
Yeah, he looks far more athletic than, you know, the the safety Jamal Adams that Seattle decided to bring in for a ton of money while also trading first round draft picks to bring him in. Jamal Adams, you mean uh, the best in the nation? Best in the nation. It's the most embarrassing game I've ever seen from somebody who calls himself best of the nation. I think it hit him it, like Ben throws a ball right at him in the head, and it's like he didn't even see it coming. But he also – it was weird. He broke on the route well. Like he was destined for a pick six, and then when he was in position to catch the ball, it's like he couldn't raise his hands up. He just got hit in the face. Bizarre. It looked like Ben almost just was like, oops, Big Ben. Dude, that guy looks like a freaking tree out there. <laughs> I don't know how. he's like. It's like Groot is your quarterback. I don't know how he's still doing it. I mean, they you know, they got the win, but barely. Yeah. Well, Big Ben's kind of cooked. Yeah, I took Seattle live plus 15 and a half. Felt like the biggest lock ever. Oh, my God. That was a hell of a cover. Yeah. Oh, that's nuts. Yeah, so I don't know. I thought the um, – yeah, it's hard to evaluate the defense in this game, right? You you knew that the defensive line was going to get theirs. You knew Aaron Donald was going to be Aaron Donald. Um, but then I think, too, look, evaluating the secondary, you know, Jalen Ramsey let the other guys do their work. Daniel Jones stayed away from him. And Taylor Rapp took advantage. Robert Rochelle had a pick in this game. Uh, he looked better after getting beat by Kadarius Tony in the first quarter. Um, so guys that are starting to come along, guys that are starting to develop – I tweeted yesterday, you're able to kind of keep your feet up and watch these guys kind of come in. The Dante Dion's of the world, the John Wolfords of the world, uh, the Jake Funks, you know, Tutu Atwell, Ben Skronik, um, Jacob Harris, all these young players who you want to see eventually develop. If you can get that in week six, in the fourth quarter of a week six game on the road, you're going to find yourself in a pretty good situation um, as you're trying to develop these kids later on in the season. So happy with what I saw yesterday. Um, not a hundred percent satisfied, um, but very close, right? I think as, as a fan watching your team go five and one um, hosting the lions at home and then going to, is it going to Houston the week after um, and then back at home against Tennessee, mm -hmm. you have a really good situation and put yourself in a good spot. So um, I, I, while I'm not satisfied and you can't be satisfied in week six, I'm pretty happy with what I've seen so far from this team. Uh, so I think my expectations are in line. I don't know, Nick, if they've exceeded or they've, Fallen below your expectations, but would like to just hear your thoughts before we wrap this one up. Absolutely have exceeded my expectations. Um, up until this point, I thought we, we would have had two losses. Uh, it seems like you got to be just – there's no fooling around in this NFC. It, the Cardinals are not going to let teams – which is just crazy. It's the Cardinals. But they're not – you know, like you got to fight for that number one spot if you want it. And it's the only one that really gets a buy. Um, I mean, maybe there may be like a week 18 buy for us if we're in a position where it's like, okay, we have this seed locked no matter what. We're just going to rest guys this week. We're going to treat it like yeah. a buy. Um, but that, uh, yeah, that week, that week one uh, postseason. You want that number one spot, so we'll we'll see what's going on. Well, you got to think you're contending with. Tampa Bay, Tampa, Arizona, Bay, Arizona, Bay. and Dallas. Those are your five. I, think, I know, but I think Dallas is going to – like, they'll win that division. Well, yeah, they're a playoff I, team. Yeah, yeah. But I don't think they're going to – like, for the teams that are still capable of getting the one seed, I would even take Green Bay out. I think it's like us, Tampa, um, Arizona. And Arizona. Yeah. yeah. I, I never leave Green Bay out of that conversation. By the way, I think Green Bay was my lock of the week. Hmm. Did they hit? Yeah. They hit. He Locked still me. owns them. Huh? So he still owns them. Oh, I thought you said you still owe me for that. I'm like, no, no. you owe me 50 bucks though for, for losing in fantasy. And I'm I happy know. that you brought that up because I know now it's it on. Was, it's on my list for today to send you $50. Good. <laughs> Good. <laughs> yeah. I think the rest of the conference, uh, it's going to be a battle, right? I think Tampa Bay, Arizona, Green Bay, Dallas, those are the five right now that, you know, there's any contention to get the first seed. Those are the five that I think have the best chance of getting out of the conference in general. Um, but again, Arizona is that team that for whatever reason, when you feel like you can put your feet up and enjoy a Sunday, you're rooting against Arizona. They ruin your Sunday this year. So um, they're going to be a team that we're going to have to consistently watch. Right. Cliff Kingsbury was out with COVID this week. They still put up 37 points on the Browns. I don't know. The team looks scary. Obviously, the Browns fell to three and three, but I, I think 
we're not going to lie to ourselves any longer. Arizona looks like a really good team. So they're going to be the ones that you have to edge out, get the top spot in the division, and attempt to get the top spot in the conference. Um, so Maybe, that, uh, that game against Arizona is going to be one of their biggest games of the whole year. When is that game? Good question. Let me pull it up real quick. Yeah. Let me see. Cardinals and Rams, December 13th in Arizona. Okay. That could be a really fun game to go to. That's going to be a great game. Yeah, if I were you, I would take the trip. Flight to Arizona is probably like less than a hundred bucks. Yeah, yeah, I may, uh, I may do that for that. Yeah, for that game. That's a good one. And then after that, the Cardinals got the Lions. So, oh, so that's a loss for them. Yeah, for the Cardinals. Yeah, yeah, of course. Maybe the All Lions right. are just looking ahead for next week. I'm sure we'll delve into that. You do a little game preview of the Lions, and then yeah, uh, we'll do a little game preview. We'll do a little. Uh, Dan Campbell video yeah. session. We'll break down some of his obscurities. I um, heard. Uh, I heard if we asked him, he would come on the pod. Just nobody wants to ask him. I'll ask him. Yeah, send him there's, ask. there's no shot he would ever come on the pod. He's. You know what? I, I remember watching. I disagree. I actually that. think there is a shot he would come on the pod. <laughs> I was watching uh, Colin Cowherd probably three four weeks ago, and he was talking about coaches that run too hot. I don't know if you ever saw that segment from him where he's talking about Gruden. Gruden runs too hot. He eventually sizzles out, which is why his record in December isn't good. And then guys that are even keel, like Harbaugh and Andy Reid and Sean Payton. You know, those are guys. Even Bill keel? Belichick. Yeah. I mean, towards later. Yeah. The the Jim Harbaugh. Jim Harbaugh. Yeah, that dude's John. like a little, like a firecracker. Well, he I mean, blows so, up is, all the time. so is Sean Payton, but they're fairly level headed throughout the entire year and they win in December. Um, so, yeah, I, I think that it's. It's a situation. Sounds like a better segment than an uh, actual uh, take. Yeah, no, I just I just feel like he's a coach that runs super hot, right? He runs off of five, six shots of espresso every morning. Do you ever hear his coffee order? Yeah, yeah. And the guy's crazy. heart's going to just implode. I can't believe he got hired to be a head coach. As soon as you heard him talk, you heard him talking about biting off kneecaps. It's all it's all heart. Yeah, it's just it's just a terrible. It's situation. no brain, and it's all heart. Yeah, it's no brain, all heart. Um, not what you want in the head coach in peewee football in high school. Dan Campbell is the best coach in the nation. In the nation, you bring him to the NFL. He's got a guy like Jared Goff, and you know that some of those post game comments are just gonna they're just gonna come out because he's emotional. He doesn't know how to talk to the media. Yeah, he doesn't know how to how to have his players back yet. It couldn't be more than a one year stint for him. I'd be embarrassed. Right. I'd be embarrassed to keep him around for another year. Um, and I think I think they probably do keep him around another year because he's such like a heart guy and like the team or like the fans really like him. And now it's the question of is Jarrett going to be kept around another year? Right. right. Yeah, that's true. Well, they're going to draft somebody. They would be crazy not to. It already feels like, yeah, it already feels like they are going to get a top draft pick and they're, they're going to get a top draft pick. Yeah, I still think uh, Goff on Pittsburgh makes the most sense, and I'm just going to float that into the universe. I'd not sure the Steel like City team. would huh? love Jared Goff, and I'm not what sure Jared that? Goff would love the Steel City. But if you're in Detroit, you're in the Motor City, not that hard of a transition. Yeah. So we'll see. Yeah, I don't know. It's going to be a fun reunion. Aubrey Pleasant, Dan Holmes, um, uh, Brad Holmes, rather. Um, you know, you got Brockers and Goff coming back. Again, it's going to be fun to see what's going on on the sidelines. We'll try to bring you guys everything for this game. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll try to get there. some. Yeah, we'll try to get some vids. You know, we'll be tailgating, be interacting with the fans. It's going to be a good time. So we're looking forward to that. And, um, yeah, that preview will be coming later this week, probably Wednesday or Thursday, because we're going to be wheels up Friday morning on our way to you guys. Um, and that's going to be that. So any, uh, any send off, Nick? Um just happy that we got this done in the morning it's kind of amazing <laughs> 6 52 a.m on your end hardest mm -hmm. worker in the room best in the nation nick Vespi. and the fantasy winner of dean's 50 bucks yeah i kind of want to send us off with the rocks new rap song because i feel like that best fits your personality <laughs> we go rumble we go take a bezel. i love that song dude it's i know so you've funny. been listening to that in the gym oh my god of course non-stop that's your MO. It's about drive. It's about power. We stay hungry. We <laughs> devour. It's, it's 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 truly a it's a blessed uh, it's a blessed song. It's no, you're welcome. Uh well, no, only because the rock only has like thirty seconds on this song. If he if the whole rap song was him, it would be number one. See the rock in the first quarter 
he had me sold in your welcome that he could rap. And then I heard face off and I questioned his ability in the second half. Well, he didn't have the genius Linda Manuel Miranda behind him <laughs> telling him how to rap. He's like, it's like Michael Buble rapping where he's just saying every single word, like and adding a syllable. It was like purely just a rap that was derived from his workouts in the gym. It's just like, like it's just like Republican dad music, you know, it's just <laughs> like, so it's so blue collar. It's uh, it's great. It's it amazing. Great. We love all it. Right. Ironically or not, I consume all media, ironic and not ironic. Yeah, I believe that. That's the kind of guy that you are. Mm -hmm. All right. Send us off, King K. Rule music. King K. Rule, send us off. The Muppet movie on um, Disney Plus was pretty good with Will Arnett. The Haunted Mansion Muppet short film that they did it was enjoyable. Thanks for listening, guys. I'm going to shine the lights on you like the Oscars. It's enough from you. <laughs> you guys. See you soon. Okay, bye. Go Rams. Go Rams.